Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. One M by One M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in annual revenue and beyond, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. This is our 402nd free mentoring roundtable. We've been doing these for coming up to a decade now. In May, we celebrated a milestone event, which was our 400th roundtable. So it's a very long journey. Over 75,000 people have participated in these roundtables, and we have had the privilege of working with entrepreneurs from all around the world and it's been fascinating to learn what's happening in different parts of the world. The event is being recorded. You will find the recording on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. On that channel, there's also many other uh, interesting videos. There are recordings of all the roundtables, and there are also other video content that you could use for learning. It's a good, actually a good body of material to learn from. Um, on Twitter, we are at 1M by 1M and at Shromana. You can follow us. We publish a lot of interesting content. And uh, if you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. Now, this is a round table, not a broadcast. So we want you to participate as much as possible. And for that, you will have the dial-in number available to you. I will put the slide up a little bit later. We're not quite ready for you to dial in yet. We're gonna have some programming before, but then we will be eventually ready for you to line up your questions. In the meantime, of course, you can use the public chat. Make sure you set your public chat to send to all participants. That way everybody can see what you're commenting, what questions you're asking, and people can engage with you, dialogue with you, and so forth. You can use the public chat also to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, where you're joining from, what projects you're working on, and so forth. We're going to start today's session with a conversation with Kelly Perdue, co-founder and managing general partner at Moonshots Capital. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. and. It's incredibly admirable what you're doing and the reach that you've had so far. Thank you, thank you. So Kelly, uh, the point of this conversation today is to introduce you to our audience and uh, get to know one another. So let's start by um, having you share a little bit about your background as well as the background of your fund. What is the investing focus? How big is the fund? What kinds of investments are you making? Let's just get to know one another. Absolutely. Well, I'm a relatively newbie as a venture capitalist. Um, I came up being an entrepreneur. I've been a, uh, a either a co-founder or part of the senior team of 10 different uh, companies that we started. Two of them were learning experiences. I make the air quotation marks there, which are very valuable, but you want to avoid those if you can. Um, five exits and three still operating profitably. Um, I do consider myself an entrepreneur, and along the way, I started making angel investments, um, and then a partner, that my partner in the fund now, we started angel investing together. Then we started leading angel syndicates. So we would invest our money and tell other angels about it, and they would invest with us, and we would get paid to carry. And then last October, we did a first close, our $40 million uh, Moonshot Capital Fund, and we've made investments in 65 companies over the years uh, and have a pretty spectacular track record. And we, we think we're pretty good at picking the companies, but we're even better at helping them after we put the money in uh, to help make them successful. And our thesis is focused almost entirely around leadership. Uh, my partner mm -hmm. and I both graduated from West Point, served in the military, and it's the only place we know where millions of dollars is spent training people specifically on leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, if you look at the, the, the success record of the 65 companies we've invested in and all the other VCs that we sit on boards with as we talk about the successes and the, fail, and the flame outs, the failures, um, the key ingredient is leadership. And so Moonshot Capital leans in heavily when there's a military veteran 
uh, on the founding team. And that military, that could be any military, it's not just U.S. military, but we think it's a, a fundamental training leadership. We also like, um, as I think a lot of investors do, uh, founders who have had previous successes in building companies. That's kind of the battle scars of experience. Now, what about uh, these 65 companies that you've invested in? Uh, how, what percentage of those have a military veteran in their founding team? Sure. We have um, just under 15 million, one five, um, assets under management that's been deployed, right? And about 70% of that uh, has been invested in teams that have a military veteran as one of the you know, co-founders. Very interesting. And what is the typical check size of what you invest in? Sure. From the fund, uh, we're late seed, early A. So that can mean a lot of things in different different parts of the world and or, uh, you know, different, you know, over the last three or four years, things have gotten a lot more elastic in terms of what that means. But our check sizes are typically five hundred dollars to $800,000 in the seed okay. piece. We're, we're frequently the first institutional investor. We're not the first investor. The companies have started generating revenue, um, you know, approaching fifty dollars to $100,000 a month in recurring revenue, um, typically. Uh, and we're, we're looking to get anywhere from 10 to 15% ownership in that seed round. Um, of the 40 million, 17 million is dedicated to first checks in, and 23 million is reserved uh, as dry powder to, uh, you know, reinvest and to, uh, continue to invest in subsequent rounds in the companies we invest in. And what um, what is the um, definition in your case of late seed, early series A? What metrics are you looking for? Sure. So, you know, typically there's still pieces of the team that need the A players inserted. Um, there's a minimum viable product, as I described, in terms of they've, you know, f found a, a problem that they've either they've built a solution, whether it's a product or a service for, and have started selling that to more than one client. Um, they've raised some money, usually it's in the two hundred to five hundred thousand dollar range previously that helped them get to that point. Frequently that's friends and family and credit cards and maybe one or two angel, you know, you know, external angels or sophisticated angels, or maybe it's an incubator. And interestingly enough, a lot of our deal flow comes from the ecosystem itself. So Tech Stars, Y Combinator, five hundred startups, they're already curating lots and lots of entries to select the companies that they think could be the most viable the most exciting, um, mm -hmm. and because because we focus and lean in heavily when there's a military veteran. On I think your audio went off. Kelly, I think your call dropped. You got it. Yeah, you're back. Great. Excellent. Go ahead. So, don't know what happened. I lost you there. So, um, from the criteria in terms of looking at wh where we want to invest, it's, you know, they have some revenue traction. There are clients that are repeat customers. Um, there's most of a management team that's put together, and they still are looking at growing and building that. Um, and they think they found a place in the market, uh, and there's more money required to explore that further. And we like to invest. Um, where there are very distinct milestones we can see and help them achieve on the way to the next round of financing. So that's, that's kind of how we're looking at that, that late seed uh, investment. What about sector? What is your uh, comfort zone? What is your interest area in terms of sector? Sure. As you might imagine, um, not every military veteran or great leader comes out and goes into the exact same sector. Um, my partner and I do have some domain knowledge. Um, I've helped my wife, 
who is building her fifth company. I've helped her build this fifth company, um, direct-to-consumer advertising and media agencies. So she's previously sold four of them, three to Interpublic Group, one to MDC, and then she uh, leading and me assisting kind of back office ops, finance, HR, everything else, have helped build up the existing company to about 50 head count and growing pretty, pretty dramatically. So anything that has to do with ad tech stack, direct to consumer, what kind of newbies call, what I call, you know, people under 30 call uh, growth hacking, we just kind of call that's, that's actually marketing. Um, so uh, and anything that would help or benefit from that, I've got a pretty deep domain expertise. Um, and then my partner, Craig Cummings, also a West Point grad, the last company that he built and sold to Daimler Mercedes was called Ride Scout. And then when they bought Ride Scout, he moved on to Daimler Mercedes M&A team focused on the U.S. So he was evaluating and analyzing, you know, potential acquisitions and or investments in the mobility, transportation, automotive, um, and mm -hmm. that kind of space. So definitely in those two categories, we have a lot of expertise, but we also get a lot of uh, cyber. So uh, both of us were military intelligence. Craig, my partner, has a lot of connectivity into and around NSA. And two of our first three companies that we invested in out of the fund um, have, have a cyber focus to them in terms of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And what about geography? Uh, we're geographically agnostic. I realize you have a worldwide audience. Um, we've only invested in the United States, um, so no specification in the U.S., um, but we're certainly not averse to looking at things from wherever it makes sense. Uh, obviously, and you're both based in Los Angeles, yeah? I'm based in Los Angeles, and my partner Craig is based in Austin, Texas. Um, okay. We have a, you know, a pretty good scattergram of, you know, geographically we've invested like all, all over the U.S. In fact, our biggest check went to a company in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So we really are agnostic. So let's uh, do a couple of things next. I'd like to understand what are you really proud of in your portfolio? What's really scaling? What's looking really interesting? And 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 as you explain to us some of these uh, case studies, if you will, give us some insights into your thinking or Craig's thinking in making the decision to invest in these companies besides the founder being a military veteran, what, what else have you factored into that thought process? Absolutely. So I think a great example is uh, our second investment out of the fund in late January of this year is a company called New Knowledge. And you might have heard, you might not have heard their company name, but I, I'm pretty sure you've heard of them. They're a uh, former Army NSA uh, you know, founders and they are the team that identified um, Russian involvement in social media using bots as it, effect, as it impacted or affected the elections in the United States. Uh, and wow. have continued to, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty phenomenal team. Um, they've got very sophisticated uh, monitoring and listening capability as well as um, interdiction capability inside of social media environments. And the, the founding CEO um, was working with the State Department previously, and the founding COO was the former Army and NSA uh, leader. Uh, they're just very compelling individuals in terms of creating a vision, being able to communicate that very effectively. And then the thing that I say to all of our entrepreneurs is sales kind of cures everything. <laughs> and um, they happen to be at a specific point in time where, you know, fake news, um, people not trusting what's going on uh, in, the st in the things that they're reading in their feeds, whether it's in the Twitter or Facebook or whatever uh, platform you happen to be, you know, visiting. Um, being able to know and understand what's legitimate and what's not, what's a bot or what's a human uh, is incredibly important, is only going to become more so, so that this kind of dystopian society that we're living in can get some grounding to it. Um, so it, it has a great cause feel to it. What is the business? Uh, is it a software as a service analytics business? Yeah, it's a software as a service business. So think about any large uh, company and or government department that wants to 
monitor and understand uh, what's being said about them and if there are activities associated with them uh, in the social media environment. So pick a large entertainment company that has what could be considered a controversial movie coming out. The last thing they want is to, on the day before the movie launches that they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on to be completely mm -hmm. blindsided by a group that either validly or not, uh, either with actual humans or bots, is creating a pretty negative campaign that launches the day before, you know, a movie opens. They'll pay, a, you know, a significant amount of money to be aware of that happening and then potentially to um, take action uh, to protect themselves. And that, that applies across multiple industries. If you look at people who are making decisions in the financial market, um, large oil and gas entities where public opinion can, be, you know, have billions of dollars of impact on their ability to uh, do exploration and R&D and that type of stuff. There, there are, and then there are obvious applications for government entities um, knowing whether or not there are, you know, potential, you know, bad actors at work preparing to do something bad. So in a situation like this, um, you know, we've had a lot of software as a service investors here. Um, there are some trends we are observing, and I'd like to get your take on that. So the ones who are doing Series A are looking for a million-dollar ARR before they're willing to write a check. Um, you know, there are some post-seed, pre-Series A people who have their own metrics. Do you have, when you're doing, when you're looking at SaaS deals, as you said, revenue is the, prob is the solution yeah. to all problems. So what is that yeah. revenue um, benchmark? Huh? What? I said, do you agree? Do you agree that sales solves just about every problem? I totally agree. Absolutely. And that's what okay. we right. constantly harp on here. So, uh, yes, and in fact, I much prefer actually companies that uh, generate revenue. Our, our definition of entrepreneurship is customers' revenues and profits. Financing is optional. So I'd rather people don't get flushed with financing and, and forget how to be, you know, disciplined about revenue. So, so I more than agree. But, uh, but what, is your, uh, what is the metric that you look for as clear validation that you so, are so ready? We, yeah, so we, we published that we like to see companies that have fifty to $100,000 of monthly recurring revenue, and which, which translates into a 600 to $1.2 million in annual, in annual recurring revenue. And the companies that we've invested in have been at $1 million and growing of annual recurring revenue. Um, mm -hmm. Not all of them, but, a lot, you know, that's, that's the rule. There are exceptions to every rule um, when there's a multi-time successful entrepreneur. It uh, depends what it is. But so, you know, we, we want to see that. And now what gets interesting, though, is we have to do a whole lot with the financials typically because your definition of recurring revenue and my definition of recurring revenue need to, might differ. I just, I, I, we just like to be on the same page with the definition of exactly what that is. And when you're talking about, you know, clients that are small and medium-sized businesses, um, you know, recurring revenue for them, might, they, they may only spend money every quarter, and it also depends on what vertical they're in. So being able to separate that and understand that and really understand churn, really stand, understand the ability to do upsell, whether that's growing the number of seats or adding more features inside of that environment are, are super important. New knowledge, the one that I just described to you, though, is, you know, in the we – don't, we don't know what the kind of the upper limit on the, on the, the pricing is, but, you know, thirty to $50,000 a month. Uh, is not is not out of the question on a lot of these on a lot of these deals for that capability. So okay. that's a little different than than when you think about you know six to ten dollars a seat you know you know per seat in a in a in a true you know Slack a la Slack uh, type of SaaS model. Yeah. Now uh, w let's do another maybe from a different sector um, that you have invested in maybe a B two C or something. Um, so there's one that's uh, B2C that's called FAIR, F-A-I-R, and the founder of that company is a gentleman named Scott Painter. He also happens to be um, a, a military veteran, um, and I, he's a, it's the second time that, I, that I've invested in him. He, he also founded TrueCar, uh, which he took from 
ideation all the way through to public to, to IPO in the United States. So in this instance, the conversation about what our decision to invest was very short. You know, Scott called me and said, um, hey, I'm doing a four, mil, 4 million investment on 12 free, um, and I'm putting 2 million myself in. Do you want any, Kelly? And <laughs> I, I said, can I have the rest? Right. This is a guy who started bunches of, you know, lot, you know, dozens of companies. Been very successful. Most recently took, and he's very, very, very focused on the automotive space. And recently took a company to IPO to multi-billion dollars. And when they offer the opportunity to invest, you try to get in. So that's when we were running the syndicate. And so I still needed some something to tell the people that might follow us. And I asked Scott, knowing that what the answer probably was, I said, Do you have any materials that I could share as we, you know, put the money in? Uh, and he sent me a, a screen grab of the logo. Um, so I'm like, all right, I'm going to have to sell this on your track record. So we, we've invested in every round, um, and his valuation has increased dramatically to the point where he's now raising hundreds of millions. This is over a three-year period. Um, he's raising hundreds of millions on the equity side through, you know, very, very large entities that you see playing in all these unicorns right now. Um, and we were in, you know, the friends and family, the seed, the seed one, the A, and we'll probably participate in the note that goes to a series B. Um, he's just a multi-time successful entrepreneur who's a, dom a domain expert in the, in the area that he's playing. He's radically disruptive, and the product basically enables you as a consumer on your phone to connect to your bank account, uh, connect to the car that you like and, you know, fare, what you want to get, and lease that car, walk in, sign on your phone, and drive the car off the lot for an indeterminate lease, meaning you can bring it back tomorrow or you can bring it back in, a, in two years. And it's a single payment for all of those items, for insurance, for uh, the, the car payment, any aftermarket things that you want to do to it. And he's looking almost at, you know, transportation as a service, if you will. Interesting. So he's a real real expert in the car industry, or car rental, car leasing, that, car buying industry. Yeah. Yes. True, true Car was radically disruptive. It basically enabled a consumer to look and see the car they wanted to purchase in their, you know, zip code and surrounding area. How much did one of those cars sell for yesterday, which was kind of the ultimate power when you're going, nobody really likes going to negotiate with a car salesperson about how much the car is and trying right. to figure out the APR and all the other components. And he just eliminated that concern, which was very, very disruptive to a, a protected dealership-run industry. Um, and he fought a lot of legal battles along the way on that, but ended up getting the company public at billions of dollars. So um, let me do a thought experiment with you on this one. If this particular concept came to you from a domain expert, somebody who understands that industry very well, but it wasn't Scott and it wasn't somebody who had track record of building a company with you and, and so on and so forth. So, but maybe he or she was a military veteran. Would you still invest? So there, there are a lot of factors in making that determination, but certainly just because it, you know, there are way more people that I don't know than there are that I do know. Um, so we're, we're not anticipating that even half of our investments are into people that we've already met. Um, we're seeing literally hundreds of deals a month and using the, some of the criteria and some more that I described to get to the point where we get the meeting, get to the point where we do follow-up meetings, uh, get a comfort level and an ability to understand that that entrepreneur isn't going to do what we tell them. That's not the, that's not the intent. That isn't by, by any stretch of the imagination more that they're open to hearing what we're saying so that we can help them avoid a lot of the company building pitfalls that Craig and I uh, have gone through and the holes we've fallen in and the walls we've run into. And if it's, if it's apparent that there's, there's some coachability and learning and listening to what we're doing, it's, we're much more likely to invest in for somebody who knows everything that they're, you know, thinks they know everything that they're doing. If that makes sense. You know, uh, our audience does have some uh, serial entrepreneurs, but the vast majority of our audience is 
first-time entrepreneurs and they're, um, you know, usually when you need money to start a company as a first-time entrepreneur, it's a problem. So, uh, so there's all sorts of things that you have to do to to be creative about bootstrapping to levels of success and metrics and and revenue, so that uh, you know some of the first-time entrepreneur issues get taken out of the conversation. So, uh, which is why I'm asking you all these questions about uh, what, how would you react if you were doing in a doing working with a first-time entrepreneur. So switching gears, though. Yeah. So, you, yeah. Go on. So Craig, Craig yeah, Craig and I, um, fourteen companies that we've been operators in. Um, we actually we, we believe that the value we add to the investment, of course, the money is super important and you need it to build. But more important than domain knowledge, we kind of, we we want the team to have the domain knowledge that we're investing in. If we can help with our networks, which are pretty pretty broad. We, w right. we will do so, obviously, and that's, that's another consideration. But where we, Craig and I add the most value is the empathy and experience of being a founder and the yeah. company building elements, right? So those first-time entrepreneurs, oh, I just got a fight with my co-founder, or I need to part with ways with my co-founder. Okay, does the company blow up or not? Uh, how do I hire my first salesperson? We're big enough now that I, I can't be doing all the sales if we're going to scale, so how do I hire my first salesperson? I mean, the list of those questions that first-time entrepreneurs have is endless. And with Craig and I being able to apply our experiences, not only, not only as an investor where you hear about them and you see them and you're kind of tangentially involved, but as an operator where you're, you know, in the shower in the morning sweating out, am I going to make payroll next month? Those are things that you can't get and understand and really feel unless you're actually, you've actually been an entrepreneur Absolutely. before. And I think that, that company building set of skills is where Craig and I add a lot of value to the entrepreneurs we invest in. So last question, I know you have to run at 8.30. You said you're seeing hundreds of deals a month. What trends are you seeing in your deal flow? And what of those trends are interesting to you? So, we're seeing much uh, more developed companies, right? So three or four years ago, um, we would see, I'd say, you know, two-thirds of our deals would be, I don't want to say ideation, but, you know, the MVP is almost done. There's going to be a market tech test next quarter when we launch. Um, now I'd say that's dropped to less than a third. Um, People are figuring out, and there are there are many, many, many ways to get that early early financing, um, yeah. and so it's almost you know the bar has risen to the point where there has to be a really good reason for them not already being in revenue for us to go past that first stage, right? Like for instance, you're you're if you're Scott Painter and it just you know or you're just starting with your new idea and you're you know in two years going to be at a billion dollar valuation, then we know that that's probable because you're a sophisticated entrepreneur. That's where we'll ignore the fact that you don't have revenue yet. But the, because there, it, especially with software, it's so relative to how it was in the past, inexpensive to get a minimum viable product up. Distribution is less expensive so that you can get enough users in to test and understand what works and what doesn't. Um, you really need to get to a point of into revenue, into a minimum viable product that's working with some, some monies raised from, from a whole bunch of different sources that are, that are available to you in order to register as a serious player that's going to be successful to an institutional VC. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, by the way, this is what we teach in our program is do not go to VCs as beggars, go as kings. So, and that's absolutely requires that you build up to a certain revenue level, certain metric level with which you can have a, have a you know, conversation that is a real negotiation as opposed to begging for money and I, I really can't move further without your money yeah. and that's a, that conversation is not a healthy conversation. So we discourage them. The, kind train of moving, the, tra the train is moving out. It's a great train. Do you want to be on it or not? It's a much better approach. Much better than conversation. I don't have Absolutely. any money. I need money. It's a good idea. So. Yeah. 
All right, well, Kelly, totally thank great. you for sharing your perspective. Thanks for coming, and uh, great to meet you. And uh, hopefully we'll find uh, stuff to work with together. Awesome. Take care. All right, folks, we are going to switch to the entrepreneur presentations. And now I want to set expectations here a little bit before we dive into that. Um, we are on your side, and this is a safe working session. So you can bring all your issues here, and we'll be happy to look at them and guide you accordingly. But uh, do, do understand that this is, um, you know, we are on your side. It's, you don't need to be defensive. You don't need to be nervous. Um, let's just work on what your issues are. Now, if you disagree with feedback that you get here, that's fine today. That's fine as well. You're going to be uh, working on your venture. You're going to be strategizing on your venture. Take the input into account and then decide what strategy you want to follow. One thing you have to be aware of, not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. So this, there is, this is not a negotiable point. This is a fact. And you do need to understand what it means to want to raise money, what qualifies you for raising money and so forth. That is, that is a learning that is a requirement to be successful in uh, technology startups. All right, we're going to start with Prakash Rastogi. Prakash, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Hi, uh, hi, Namata. Uh, uh, Kelly is still here or uh, he left? He left. Hi. Uh, Kelly is gone. Hi, uh, Sama. Yeah, hi, hi, Samana. Uh, so thanks for uh, connecting us. Uh, so we, uh, we, we are a two-year-old company. We started in 2016. Uh, from since then, we are we are running this company. Uh, this is a completely boost bootstrap. Uh, we have already invested almost uh, 200,000 uh, 200, uh, dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so it started by uh, me and uh, Prakash and uh, Asis. Uh, so I look after the sales and Prakash, Asis is looking into the development side. Uh, we both were running uh, their own company previous to start this company. Uh, that was a pure software consulting firm. Uh, I sold that company uh, in 2016. Uh, my company name was Linchpin Technologies. Uh, that was a pure IT consulting. We have around 100 people team in uh, NIDA, uh in India. And we were mainly into the mobile application development. Asis was also running another company called Dream Apple, which we uh, set it down uh, once we started with this software person. Okay. Next slide. So uh, while, while we were running uh, our company, we figured out uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, people are having a huge amount of content. You go to airport, there are a lot of content they have. Uh, they have a lot of information which flight is uh, going on, what are the, where are the their facilities are, who are the paths, etc. Hospital, if you go, they have a lot of, so many doctors. Each doctor has a different kind of expertise. Uh, they have the food port, they have a different, different uh, facilities. Uh, if you go to the retail brand, they have thousands of products, and uh, they they wanted to so uh, tell the story uh, to their customers. So they, uh, in in a way, they have a lot of digital content, uh, but they are not knowing how to display those content uh, to the right audience. So that's the problem we shared and uh, we thought of solving this problem. And then everybody having that problem, so uh, we build up a framework, uh, this the SaaS based uh, framework, and that's what uh, we we are. Uh, so next slide. So, so uh, our our solution is uh, we we are providing them a mobile application and the kiosk, uh, so interactive kiosk. So uh, user walks into the store or user walks into the airport, hospital. They can they can browse through the content, and all these contents are the cloud managed. The same information, if you want to take, they can take on the mobile phone. So this complete framework, and then obviously they are analytics, so they are meaningful business information. We are getting out of those information, which page people are uh, looking after, which path normally they are following, or which keyword they are searching for, those things, yeah. So the other three solutions we have, one is a virtual paper, this is a mobile app and the website uh, 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 generator. So using our platform, we can generate the mobile app and the, and the website in the same day. You just need to put the container up and running. 
uh, virtual kiosk is our interactive screen solution and virtual tab we have not yet built up virtual paper we build up in, in, to start with and then uh, we build up the virtual kiosk these two solutions are already implemented in the market with uh, almost 20 customers uh, virtual tab is still into the uh, like in the idea stage where uh, these uh, the sales guy uh, for the sales representative they have a special kind of uh, features uh, where they, they if they are visiting to the customer location or if they are visiting for any sales ordering then they can uh, show the information and they can take the order. Next slide. So in the past two years, uh, we have acquired. Uh, so in the, in the la like uh, in the last um, six months, we have acquired the client, the all the big uh, names in India, uh, Kent Aro, uh, Hero Cycles, Philips, uh, Japan, uh, Ambience Mall, Sleepwell. So all, all these uh, guys, they are uh, they are developing. Uh, they have uh, almost 300, 400, or thousands of products. Or uh, those products, the uh, information they wanted to share with their customers. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the one problem. Uh, so and then uh, since India is a multilingual country, uh, so they're huge. Uh, like uh, so, there there are almost a hundred languages people are speaking, and then the, these companies having a pan India operation. So they need uh, content to be shared in their their local language. So yeah. uh, that's not possible with the printed catalog. Uh, so that's problem we solve for them. And the second problem they had is uh, they have the their own franchise store. They are they are, they are uh, putting uh, like it's not possible for a store to keep all the items they are they are uh, they are manufacturing. Uh, in yeah. in case of Hero Cycle, they have almost 300 different kind of cycles, and the cycles cost start from 5,000 to uh, 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 300 dollars to uh, you can say. Uh, 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 one lakh rupees, uh, that's the something around two and two hundred thousand dollars, uh, two thousand uh, dollars. All those cycles, uh, one uh, one store can't keep uh, always on their store. And if a customer walks in, they wanted to uh, know a lot of details, so they can have an interactive screen, and then using that screen, they can tell the, even the stories. See the, why this cycle is better than the other cycle. So the user, uh, if user has a question, they can immediately answer with the help of. They are not dependent on the printed catalog. And if user wants the more information uh, to carry, then they can download their app and they can walk into walk out, out from the store. So there's a whole framework we have built up. We started with a, a, a listing app like a, a called Virtual Paper. Then we realized you no know, people are expecting their own uh, white label app, and we started creating in the 2017 like. Uh, Early 2017, we started creating this virtual paper as a white label app, and then uh, slowly we moved to the, having a large screen display. And now we, uh, this large screen displays are already implemented in the uh, big mall in uh, uh, Ambience Mall. Uh, mm -hmm. There is uh, like, uh, millions of people are visiting in a month. Uh, uh, then we have uh, all these customers, uh, and then we we have almost generated 40,000 in uh, 40,000 dollars uh, in revenue till now in the last one year. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, now, now so we started. What is, uh, model? what is the business model and what is the pricing model that you're using to yeah, close so, these deals? So, 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 pricing model we are using, uh, we have a core platform. Uh, core platform we cost 300, uh, 300, uh, 3 lakh rupees, uh, this is 300k rupees. Uh, uh, and then the mobile app, if somebody wants the iPhone app, uh, then the another 75,000 rupees per, per year. Uh, if they are asking for the Android app, then it's a 75,000 rupees per year. If they are going for the kiosk, there's an interactive screen, then uh, it's the 5,000 rupees per kiosk per month. This is our standard uh, uh, costing to them, uh, but it depends uh, like uh, how many screens they require. If somebody like if we go to malls or hospitals, we start with uh, giving them a 20 kiosk, uh, something like that. Uh, they they start discussion with the uh, they they want to have a 20 kiosk in their. Uh, Whole mall or whole uh, hospital, and then uh, we we so and the, it's all the uh, SaaS model. So we charge on the yearly basis. Or now nowadays, uh, since we we require initially the fund, then initially we try to sell all the yearly annual fee, uh, taking advance. Uh, but nowadays we started uh, giving them on the monthly basis or the quarterly basis. So we be able to. And what if you look uh, at your revenue base and your customer base? What is the best selling? You seem to have several different products. Um, what is the best selling product right now? Of the whether it's so kiosk or. So till now or, we have only two. So till now we build up the virtual paper and virtual kiosk. 
uh, virtual paper is a mobile app and virtual kiosk is an interactive screen. So these two are combined to each other. So even the customer start with the virtual paper, we, uh, later they, they go for the virtual kiosk. Uh, and then if they are starting with the virtual kiosk, they go for the. So if we go to the mall, hospital, airports, uh, museums, there they start with the virtual kiosk. They, they look uh, uh, like interactive screen. But interactive screen has their own limitations. If, if a user is start using that uh, screen, they will be taking another 10 minutes. So, so, uh, so if some other user want to, uh, so one screen can be used by uh, six people or maybe 10 people in an hour. Uh, so, so to scale up, uh, they always need a mobile app. So, if some user uh, is more excited with the information, they can download their app. Then we start telling them a museum or maybe the hospital. Or, uh, uh, so, why not you get the mobile app too? And then they see how uh, we sell the each other. So, these, these two products are complementing each other. So, if you have a interactive screen, you always want to have a mobile app, so you can, with the same technology, you can cater to the thousands of users uh, simultaneously. So this is, this is uh, the uh, current, uh, currently we are having almost $7,000 uh, $7, uh, $7, as a revenue per month. Uh, slowly we are, we are trying to increase, uh, each month we are adding two or three customers. Uh, in the last uh, six months we have added one customer, one or two customers each month. Uh, and then they are revenues are coming in like uh, two to three months uh, uh, time. Uh, so, so this is how we are we are running. And then, so, so to scale it up, uh, to uh, like you uh, uh, even the Kelly was mentioning, uh -huh. uh, they need revenue before you go for the CJ. Uh, so, so we need a small uh, seed fund uh, to uh, increase our revenue uh, to a level where we can go for the CJ. Next slide. I will show you the figures. Uh, uh, just a second. Who is streaming this noise, Maureen? Is there somebody who's trying to come in, or is, is somebody behind you, Prakash, who's streaming noise? We need to cut no, the noise, no. otherwise the call quality is degrading. Okay. So okay. let's look at this. Um, you are. So are you on a, a calendar year? Are we reading a calendar year or a March to March financial year? Yeah, March to March financial year. So the each okay. quarter. Uh, so the the value to written here is the per month. It's a monthly revenue rate. It's not the quarter. Again. But this, so, what you're uh, showing so here is a this this Q2 18 is last quarter of Q2 Q uh, is last quarter's number, right? Right, right, right. And and you you haven't got a seed though. You're showing a seed here, but you haven't got a seed. No, we have not got it, Steve. Okay. So whatever the seed uh, money we are getting for the investor is the uh, very costly money. So uh, like you said, we don't want to uh, take any costly money. So we, we got somebody oh. who are asking for, okay, I'll give you 50 lakh, uh, 100k and I'll take 20% of equity, I don't know. So uh, yeah, we, terrible. Terrible. we rejected that. We don't want yeah, we don't that. that no. So Prakash, my read is that uh, I think your, your pitch needs to be packaged because um, you know, the the companies that get valued well are companies that can show repeatability and acceleration capability. So even if you do not reach the, you know, million dollar ARR to qualify for Series A, if you can show a path to that happening in a, reason, in a reasonable time frame, you can raise good Series A at a good price point. I mean, good seed at a good price point, good uh, deal. But I think the problem is that your product, is, your company is not packaged very well. Um, so I, you know, I can help you with that. Uh, I, if you hang on, I will explain to you how to use one million by one million. But my sense is that, you know, like when I'm looking at this business, mm -hmm. I'm looking at these, you know, two products, right? The virtue paper and the virtue kiosk. And you're telling me that you're going to airports and malls and so forth and coming in with virtue kiosk. Um, I, I'd need to understand that sales cycle and the most importantly, the total available market for those deals. Is that the best way to go to market for this company? Or the best way to go to market for the company is more something else. Like if you look at your customer base, you have hero cycles. Now, hero cycles, they are not necessarily only going to market through uh, malls and airports and so forth. So they have a 
you know, this is a kind of company that has franchises and so forth. It, you, it may be easier to go, go to market with a different, with more from the mobile side and, and layer in the kiosks um, as, you know, as and when needed. I think you, my, my hunch, just looking at a little bit of your information, is that the amount of effort it will take to, to crack the kiosk deals to, to open an account through a kiosk deal is a, it's a longer sales cycle and lower TAM, lower per account TAM strategy. Going in through mobiles is a much, much higher leverage deal. The other impression I have just listening to you, and I need to look at it more carefully, is I think your price point, the pricing strategy, is very low. The kinds of things you're doing, now we have to do some pricing analysis to to come out to really extract the real pricing for it. Now that you have customers going forward, you may be able to raise your price point significantly. And so if you can do two things, one is if you can come up with a better strategy for accelerating the sales cycle and the go-to-market strategy and raise your pricing, this curve that you're showing here will look very different. And that's what I would like to work with you on. If I were to work with you, that's what I would focus on. Yeah, uh, so, so it also depends on the uh, market scenario, like uh, here uh, we are dealing in the Indian market and uh, people are initially, uh, people are very adverse, like uh, they, they do not want to try. Uh, so so that's where uh, we started with the little lower cost, but slowly we are started increasing the cost as the uh, demand are getting up. Uh, the second uh, uh, question, like uh, the the concern you raised, uh, who is uh, so Hero Cycle or uh, the the company who owns a brand, they always start with the mobile app. But the the people who are uh, in your hospital, museum, airports, those always go with the uh, kiosk. So this is how how the trend is. Right. So whenever That's we right. go to the retail brand, we, that, we never try to pitch them a uh, uh, kiosk. That's not my point. My point is, should you be going after the airports and hospitals and so forth, or should you be going after the brands? My hunch is you should be going after the brands, and I think you can do bigger deals by going after the brands. That's my point. Okay, 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 makes sense. And, and by the way, your point about that you're going after Indian companies and the investors actually in software as a service deals, they want global plays. So you're going to have some issue until you can spin this as a global opportunity, you're going to have some issues. So we do need to work on that as well, on, on turning this into a global opportunity. And in the global market, content management platforms exist. You're going to face a competitive landscape out there, so we have to figure out a positioning. If you have to pitch this as a global opportunity, you have to figure out how do you position in a crowded content management market. That's another thing that we need to work on. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, yeah. So this, this is uh, what uh, so to get to uh, to get to uh, up to a, le a level where we can uh, comfortably. Uh, this is what we believe. Uh, so for series A, uh, we need another six uh, to eight months of uh, running our operation and increasing the sales continuously uh, till we are we are getting into the around ten to twelve lakh rupees uh, per month. Uh, so that's where uh, we, we were uh, looking to uh, raise uh, another seed round uh, apart from what we have uh, invest already invested uh, here. Uh, so that's the another uh, six to eight months of the burn rate with the same or uh, similar kind of operation. Uh, we are increasing much of our cost. And then uh, obviously we are, we are looking after uh, like in the uh, starting of uh, 2019 uh, to raise a series A. Okay. All right. So that's well, the that's yeah. Why don't you hang on for so a bit? I will explain how to use. Let me do a few more uh, discussions, presentations, yeah. and then I'll explain so how to use one and by one. So and you can decide if you want to use it or not. So the, this is our product roadmap, and this is how our products look like, and then how, the, the way we are we are providing it to uh, people. Okay, I understand. I understand what you're doing, and uh, I understand what you need to do as well. So mm -hmm. um, let uh -huh. let me do yeah. a Amrish's presentation, and then we'll come back to. Uh, to you in a yeah. moment. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Okay, thanks very good. Good yeah. execution, by the way. So far, good execution. Amrish, you're up next. Amrish, are you on the call?
Okay, so Abdullahi is on the call. I know I have to talk to Abdullahi and Amrish. So I can somebody tell me who's on the call, then I will accordingly advance to their presentation. So Maureen, somebody called Shayan Tahir is sending a lot of private messages. Uh, is he on the roster to pitch? Okay, Shayan, if you're not, if you haven't sent in slides in advance, then uh, you will not be able to, you know, obviously present your slides because we haven't got your slides yet. But if you hang on, I will put the dial-in number up and you can dial into the call and, and talk about your experiences and your questions and everything. So just hold on for a bit, okay? Let me figure out what is going on with Amrish and uh, Abdullahi. So neither is on the call. Both of you, Amrish, Abdullahi, if you want to participate and present your slides, you're going to need to dial into the call. Otherwise, I cannot work with you and your presentation. Okay, I'm going to explain to you how to use 1 million by 1 million while Amrish and Abdullah are figuring out whether they want to call in or not. Now, if you like what we are doing here in 1 million by 1 million, please bring serious entrepreneurs into the program, whether it's your friends or family who are, you know, entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs who are looking to figure out how to build a business. This is a very good methodology. 1 million by 1 million is a proven methodology. We have built many, many companies using the methodology at this point. So you can get very you know, clear guidance on exactly how to put one foot before the other and navigate through your challenges. So uh, the way to use the program is you have to go to 1mby1m.com and you will find a bunch of free resources, which primarily is content. You can follow our blog, which is for free, and you will learn a lot. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series is 12 volumes of books and you can learn from those as well that deal with specific topics. But they're all case study based books. So there are 12 to 16 case studies of successful entrepreneurs in there. And you'll learn each of those topics on how, based on how they have done it. So bootstrapping with a paycheck, you're holding on to your day job and building a company on the side. That's fine. There are very significant companies that have been built in that mode. And of course, eventually you will quit your job and, and go full time with your venture. But in the early bootstrapping stage, this is a proven methodology and you can use it and so on and so forth. There's all kinds of methodology elements you can learn from the book series. These roundtables happen week after week after week, every week. And uh, you, you're very welcome to keep attending these roundtables and listening to the recordings on our YouTube channel. The full acceleration program is 1M by 1M premium, and that is a $1,000 annual membership fee for extensive methodology guidance. We have a curriculum that is a case studies and video lectures based curriculum that you can access from anywhere in the world. The strategy consulting is through roundtables like this, but for members only, also accessible from anywhere in the world. We do help you with business development, potential introductions to potential customers, uh, investors, media analysts, other mentors, and we help you with financing where you are, um, you know, if you are fundable. Of course, there is a question of getting to fundability. What we were just talking to Prakash about is there, are, there is a packaging issue, there's strategizing issue, there's all sorts of, you know, issues that are involved in getting to fundability. We'll help you with that as well. And then we have a lot of cloud in the media and we'll help you with media relations. Now, um, the 1M by 1M self-assessment is, is a series of questions that's available on our uh, website. You should take this questionnaire and ask yourselves how to answer these questions on, based on your business. If you get stuck 
on anything, if you're getting stuck on methodology points, go do the 1M by 1M curriculum and plug those methodology gaps because this methodology is what you're going to need to build a business. And there's no need to have methodology gaps. But for almost nothing, you can plug your methodology gaps very easily. So anyway, dig around on the website, look at you know, all the content that we have there explaining how to use the premium, how to use the basic, what to expect from those programs, lots of videos, FAQs, video FAQs, description of the curriculum. The curriculum is 100% case study based. It's video lectures, case studies, video interviews, regular interviews, and so forth, and you're learning from over 800 successful entrepreneurs. Of these, 50 plus have built unicorn companies. Another 400 are venture funded companies, 350 plus are uh, bootstrap businesses. Our methodology is bootstrap first, raise money later. Methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups, and then you can raise money once you reach the metrics. You heard Kelly talk about that you kind of need to be a, a business where, you know, you feel like the train is leaving and you tell the investor, do you want to get on the train or not? That is really the way you want to work with investors, not in a begging mode. So that's it. Um, we have three roundtables, two more in June and then four more in July. So come to any of those, sign up and, and book your slot. We also have in-person rendezvous in Cafe Boroni at Menlo Park if you're local. So we have two more in June and three more in July. Uh, you're welcome to come to any of those. Um, so we are open now for uh, dialogues by calling in or in public chat. I will take questions both in public chat as well as talk to you if you're dialing in. So right now I believe Shayan Tahir is on the call. Shayan, please unmute your line and tell us what you're doing. Yes, hi, it's a pleasure to connect with all of you. Um, yes, so uh, I'm running an e-commerce store and uh, uh, we've been running this uh, since 2008. It's, um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's based out of Pakistan and uh, I started this off in 2008 when we were pretty much the pioneers for the industry at this our part of the world. And before I start off, uh, you know, English is not my first language, so excuse uh, if I'm making any mistakes. Your English so, is perfect, uh, no problem. Okay. okay, that's great. Okay, so in 2008 when we started off, we were pioneers and we realized that if we we're to scale this business, we have to make it into a business and not a startup. Uh, because at part part of the world, I mean, there's no concept of investing or funding or any That's of those right. things weren't around. So for me, you know, uh, uh, I didn't even know that I'm trying to become my uh, become an entrepreneur. Uh, mm -hmm. I was becoming a businessman. So I started this off myself with with no funding. Um, we had a hundred dollars, which I saved out of my last uh, um, job, which was out of a call center, and. Uh, I picked a few products which I liked for myself, and I went on to sell it on a classified website um, mm -hmm. because I used to look up to Amazon and the eBay's of the world, and uh, you know I realized that uh, maybe now, not now, but maybe in the next few years, uh, this is going to catch on to to here at, uh, in our part of the world, and that's how we started off. And uh, after getting our what first were you sale, selling, uh, which, which, which category were you selling? Okay, so I wanted an iPod for myself, and uh, surprisingly, Amazon didn't ship to Pakistan, so that gave me an idea of having our own Amazon here in Pakistan where I can sell all these products uh, because, uh, uh, you know, these products weren't easily available. So mm -hmm. eventually, I ended up uh, placing an order with this Chinese website, uh, which were selling replica iPods, and I eventually ended getting one of those for myself, because, but because the price was so good, and I realized that, you know, people around me might want it. Mm -hmm. I, instead of getting one, I ended up ordering uh, two more um, because I just wanted, you know, my iPod to come in for free. And I eventually ordered three for myself. I went to the custom clearing office, got it all cleared my, myself, I actually understood the whole process. And uh, uh, then I went on to, you know, um, try to sell this on a classified website because I didn't have my website to do that. And um, I, after a month of listing that, I eventually sold the product online 
And uh, the first customer that we had, I went to deliver myself. And this lady was traveling from Canada. She was a Pakistani living over there. <clears throat> and for her, it was like a, com um, a normal thing that she did uh, because she was so used to buying order online. And for us, you know, it was the first order that probably went through uh, as an electronic order that went through in Pakistan. So uh, that's how our journey started off. And, and um, um, from, from getting one product in, uh, realizing we, we don't have the capital to get in a lot of products to sell, uh, so yeah. we hit the local market and uh, we managed to find a lot of products which were lying around, which we saw potential could be sold online. And mm -hmm. we eventually, uh, you know, started off... Uh, um, we, I mean, we started off an e-commerce store later on, but first we just went on to sell these products on a classified and got certain amount of traction, uh, which mm -hmm. was sufficient enough to basically, um, you know, get our bills paid. And that's when one of our customers, because I used to deliver the products myself in the early days, and one of the co customers I met, he was a web developer, and he gave me the idea of why don't you open up your own website, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I can, and and then we got into this deal. Uh, we gave him a half price on the product he was buying, and he, in exchange to that, gave us the website. So uh, that's how the journey started. And since then, I mean, it's been about 10 years now. So since then, we've been scaling this. When I say scaling, our scaling has been more about keeping it very organic, bootstrapping the business, um, mm -hmm. you know, trying to invest, reinvest from what we make. Uh, because there haven't been too, uh, you know, opportunities, a lot of opportunities to actually fund your businesses, and that's pretty much the case so f till date um, at a part of the world. Uh, but because the market had so much potential, we're the sixth largest population. Uh, we're a young nation. Most of these, uh, you know, 75% of Pakistan is below the age of 25. So you know, all of that works really well for us. And uh, now the internet penetration was also picking up. Back then, it wasn't all that good. But in the last mm -hmm. 10 years, we've seen that, you know, come, come uh, to a different scale altogether. So, yes, so uh, the journey is good, great of bootstrapping it. But then you see... Where are you now? What's the level? The how, how much revenue are you making? What products are you selling? Right. So we are an A to Z store. We're selling pretty much from everything to anything. And uh, we did $5 million in revenue. We are a cash flow positive business. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, it's still not ra largely, I mean, a great size uh, when you start comparing us with the other companies around the region. Uh, but then uh, we have a different story. We are an organic bootstrap com um, uh, strap company. Uh, I remember when we started off, that's when the Flipside guys started off in India as well, and we were sharing the same kind of numbers till obviously they did their first round and then things changed. While obviously we didn't have such uh, opportunities, we went on to take the other route of just focusing on the customers that we required and trying to satisfy them and trying to make them reorder so that we can maximize on our revenues and profits and we can So how many more. customers so, are you are you servicing? Yes, yeah, so 200,000 are the registered user base that we have who've ended up buying things from us. So I mean just registered users are quite a lot more, uh, but 200,000 are the customers who bought something from us. Yeah. And these are repeat buyers? Yes, uh, most of them. 70% are repeat buyers. Okay. So we and, tend to focus um, a lot on the customers we've acquired because we don't really go out to market ourselves. These customers get us a lot of customers, and then right. we're pretty Before, much all the time you know, trying excellent. to manage the load that we get organically. And what is your customer? What is your um, most popular product category? Yes, yeah, so it's electronics. Generally, because we because we don't market, we drive all our traffic through search, right? And search is yeah. basically what's being tri um, so, I mean, people search Driving. for electronic products, and that's what we sell. And and it gives us, I mean, mostly electronics are high ticket items. It gives us great revenues, and also therefore give us good profits. So yes, that's our forte. We tend to focus a lot more into this. Fashion is huge, but we don't really get into it because we know it's a loss-making business. So we're very focused mm -hmm. towards our bottom line at all times, and, and we have to keep it this way. We could have taken Absolutely. the other route and maybe going for a bigger segment. The ticket size is a much smaller there, um, and we can have a large amount of transactions happening, but it's probably not going to be beneficial for the bottom line of the company. That's why we try to avoid that. Well, it, what you've done is an ex extraordinarily good 
bootstrapping story. So you should be very proud of yourself. And, and uh, w what brings you here? Tell me, what are you looking for? How can we help you? Right. So uh, the reason I wanted to join the program and uh, and it, you know, the reason I came to this was um, in the recent past, uh, we had Rocket Internet come to the scene in Pakistan, you know, put in some VC money and really scale up their business. Um, mm -hmm. Not profitable, but in a different way. And, and then they were able to sell it to Alibaba. They recently entered. So we're number two. We're the organic players in the industry. Uh, but obviously having a giant like Alibaba come to the market, we feel that this is time where we really, you know, leave, forget about the bootstrapping side of things. Because um, my strategy four years ago when Rocket Internet came in was to just wait and see because I knew that Rocket Internet is going to be spending in a lot of money just to scale the business. And uh, that's not a long-term strategy. They would eventually have to either exit or, or maybe, yeah. um, you know, t take some other route around it. But with Alibaba, it's different because they're in it for the long game. And I know that, you know, this whole organic play probably might not work anymore. So this is where we plan on make it, maybe getting out and making connections and maybe trying to um, very, uh, close our first round. And uh, I don't know if it's too late, but uh, uh, because, you know, no, we've been no, running this No, no, it's not too late at all. Years. Look, anytime you have built a business that is, uh, you know, a solid business, it is never too late for financing. I think the question that you're going to have to address in, if, you know, in, in a fundability equation is that um, it has taken you 10 years to get to 5 million. How long, what is your projection now? Let's say you put in some money. What have you learned in this process? What kind of a business are you building? The question that you're going to run into is the general merchandising is not going to be appealing to investors. If you're everything to everybody, that is not going to be appealing to investors. But you do have 200,000 customers who are repeat buyers. What category, you're saying consumer electronics is the category, is it consumer electronics private label? Is it consumer electronics branded? Where in consumer electronics are you going to play? If it's a private label so business. banking on the brands. Yes, we are banking, banking on the brand side of things. Yeah, because brands is what uh, brands are what gets the customers to come to us, and we, with very little marketing, can bank on in these big brands. And what's preventing Amazon or Flipkart to step into your territory? Well, yes, that's definitely an option that that can happen in in a slightly longer play. Uh, we have options of ten cent, maybe looking into this segment as well. Uh, because Pakistan is a very nascent new market, but it's, it's a definitely a huge market in, in all aspects. Uh, we have a retail market of 200 billion, um, um, which is uh, uh, what's on the paper, and then there's another talk, undocumented market, which is much bigger in size. So online well, I mean, retail the obvious just, thing, uh, the obvious question that you're going to get from investors is that, uh, you know, is this a company? Is this a is this a market that? you're going to get squashed by Amazon and Flipkart. And now Flipkart has Walmart behind them. So um, that's, that's the real question. And the question then, so I, I mean, I'll be happy to work with you. you. You clearly are a very good entrepreneur and, and I'm, I'll be delighted to coach you through this process and help you with your strategic planning. I think it's with good pleasure. strategic I've planning, you will have a successful... Before we move so, uh, this forward, I recently got an opportunity by by a local player. I understand the opportunity does not sound all that good when you start comparing us with companies in other parts of the world. But with, for Pakistan, I feel you know the opportunity is is decent in size. No, they no, I'm not saying the opportunity is not good. All, all I'm saying is from an investor who is looking at investing in this company, there is the, you know there's op strength, weakness, opportunity, and and threat. There is a threat. Yeah. That threat is something that you have to mitigate and you have to present a story to investors that they feel like, okay, we can counter this threat. That is the story that I will, if I were working with you, that is the story I will help you build. Sure. I'm looking forward to it. And I'll definitely be reaching out with you through this forum and also through LinkedIn okay. and would love to sign up and, and get this moving, most definitely. Sounds good. Sounds good. Join the premium program and let's start working on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pleasure speaking with you. you have a nice Pleasure day. Pleasure speaking you. with you as well. You are an excellent entrepreneur, so do not underestimate yourself at all. Very kind of you to say that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome.
So folks, uh, anybody else, questions, comments? Um, if you'd like to interact by calling in, please do. And let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson, who uh, will be happy to speak with any of you about the program if you have questions. Um, so, Maureen Vikrant has changed the name of his company to Future Today. So you may want to switch the name of uh, the company in this slide and the testimonial on the website as well. He started when he first was in the program, it was iFood TV. Now it's Future Today. And they're not just doing food television, they're doing a variety of different consumer lifestyle channels on connected TV. That's why he changed, changed the name of the company. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Prakash is asking, how do you do valuation of a SaaS-based company? You know, um, some of it is pure, uh, you know, ARR-based, MRR, ARR-based, like if you've gotten to a certain MRR, certain ARR, um, there's a certain valuation that you can expect to get. There's also issues about competitive landscape and positioning. There's questions about, you know, like in a, in a lot of cases, SaaS companies acquire customers where the lead comes in through Google search. And, and then you have to be mindful about how expensive are the keywords that you're bidding against um, and how competitive is that marketplace. Those things all drive, um, you know, the opportunity. And then the other thing is how far along are you and how fast are you growing? If you're, if you have gotten to a point where you're growing really fast already, like Slack, for instance, if you followed the story of Slack, Slack was growing so fast, everybody was running all over themselves. All the investors were running all over each other to invest in that company. So, so when investors start bidding against each other, the valuation also goes up. Does that answer your question? Early stage valuation is not a mathematical concept. Early stage valuation is highly subjective and there are many factors that go into determining that valuation. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments, issues? Shamana? Yes. I have, I have a question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Explain the concept of arbitration and how entrepreneurs can use arbitration. What do you mean arbitration? As it, as it applies to technology entrepreneurship. Concept arbitration, sorry. Oh, con concept arbitrage, not arbitration. Arbitra. That's a whole different. Arbitra. Arbitration is mediation, mediation of a conflict. Yes. Sorry, arbitrage, sorry. Concept, arbitrage. concept arbitrage. So actually what you just heard from um, Shayan Tahir is a story of concept arbitrage, right? E-commerce as a concept has, uh, has been a very big success in the Western world and in, actually in China as well, it's been a huge success. But in Pakistan, it's a, it's a relatively nascent market and, and uh, Shayan has very successfully done a concept arbitrage on general merchandising e-commerce in Pakistan. So if, there, if you see a concept anywhere in the world that you see is growing well and, and getting traction, you can morph it, you can interpret that concept in your geography, wherever you are, and, and build a business using that concept and arbitraging that concept into your geography. That's concept arbitrage. And, and a lot of businesses today are being built with con concept arbitrages of companies and ideas that have been successful in the United States. And, okay. and how, so, how 1M by 1M can be used um, for entrepreneurs who want to execute on concept arbitrage? Well, uh, 
two ways probably. One is uh, there are a lot of concepts that we have fully developed case studies around in the program, in the curriculum. So you can, uh, you know, you can basically study that how those entrepreneurs put one foot before the other and replicate that. And the second thing is, you know, the one M by one M company building methodology is a proven methodology. And you can basically apply that methodology back to that concept and build up uh, your company accordingly. Thank you. All right, folks, I'm going to, you're very welcome. I'm going to adjourn uh, for today and we'll meet you back here next week. And basically for the next six weeks, all of June and all of July, we are around and, and there will be regular schedule of, you know, um, round tables and rendezvous. So I will look forward to catching up with you in, you know, one or the other or both as on an ongoing basis. And then in August, we have some schedule uh, changes because of some travel, but June and July are completely full regular schedule. So we have lots of opportunities to work together. Be sure to sign up for, if you want the slot to pitch, be sure to sign up so we can, uh, Maureen can make sure that you have a slot. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Bye.